conversation about pitches. I'm really excited about this one. Um, but really, I figured for this event of PitchCon, we should have a PitchCon versation. All right. So, <laughs> so let's talk about pitching. And I think this is the thing that people are most curious about for the most part is understanding, you know, most importantly, watching pitching and how to understand that. And I'm recognizing every individual pitch on the fly as we watch games. And I understand that part of this uh, presentation is going to be a little bit, um, it's going to be a little bit basic at first as we establish a foundation for understanding pitching, but then we're going to get more into the advanced stuff as we go. So as we recognize pitch types, we understand expected velocity, uh, their movement and location intent. So if we learn those things about each pitch, then all of a sudden we can see the game in a different way. So then we can grasp every at bat as it happens, we understand it. So of course, at the very end, I'll have a Q and A. Um, before we jump into everything though, I want to, I want to have some fun here. I, I'm about to show you a pitch from last year that kind of took Twitter like crazy. Uh, everyone was calling this black magic nuts. And I think by the end of this, uh, this presentation, if you think that now you will understand what is truly going on. This is a pitch by Oliver Drake and everyone would just could not understand what was going on. Right, that looks crazy as if he's throwing, you know, it's throwing to the left, but it's actually going all the way to the right. And how does he make that work? What's going on? I'll show it one more time. Nuts, right? Like how, how is that working? I don't know. So I actually do, and you will too. Okay, so we're gonna go to every single pitch right now, talk about the basics of it and how we can, like all the, all the hints we can get to recognizing it on the fly. So first of all, four seam fastball, the most basic one. Um, it's known inside of pitch FX and StatCast, and it's on PitchList as well, of course, with our leaderboard. Um, they, they It normally has two different names, either FA or FF. That is four seam or fastball for FF. And then FA, I think it's just fastball, just a generic one. That's why it's FA. Um, so the velocity of it, it generally ranges from high 80s, upper 90s, not surprising stuff here. And Jared Weaver and Rollis Chapman, like, come on, guys. Like, that's not a typical four seam fastball. So we're going to ignore that one completely. Uh, we, uh, we normally see them around the mid 90s from 92 to 93 or so. Uh, then the movement uh, of these pitches are normally typically straight as an arrow, right? So you have four seamers. They're about 92, 93. That's easy to tell. And then it's going to go straight up normally, just like a little bit of rise. Essentially, the rise is based on how much spin the ball has. The more spin it has, the more that it actually stays up and doesn't drop as much as a batter expects. So there really obviously is no such thing as technically rise. There's no rising fastball. It's just not dropping as fast as a typical, typical heater does. So more spin helps that work. But there are times that there's cut action, right? And what, what is that? And how does it separate from a cutter? Well, I'll talk about a cutter a little bit later. But cut action is essentially uh, getting on the side of the ball slightly so that the ball moves from arm side to glove side. Um, just a touch. And just, just a little bit, very subtly, sometimes you'll see it from maybe Tyler Glasnow during that Chicago White Sox start last year where he had like 11 strikeouts or so. Yeah, that was like all of a sudden the last moment it goes in a little bit towards a lefty if you're a righty. Um, and, and also keep in mind, I'm going to be talking from the perspective of a righty, the most part righty against a right-handed batter, unless I say otherwise. So cut action, slight go glove side, horizontal and vertical movement. It's a little bit of a dip down, a little bit of a diagonal, but most of the time it's, it's more of that horizontal bend. And there's also some ride sometimes. Like you've seen a four seam fastball where a guy throws it and it goes more to the right than you think. Like, is this a two seamer? Is this a four seamer? And that's a product of arm angle uh, and, and kind of how he's throwing the ball. So before we go forward and then right, horizontal movement rooted in arm angle, a brief word on that, right? We, we should kind of address this. What am I talking about when I say arm angle? So it's all about how the ball is released out of your hand. And I actually have a ball. So essentially, we're talking about this is a straight arm angle. This is a low arm angle. And what you're going to see, if you can see my in the little video there, that uh, my wrist is going to change as I move my arm. So the main thing about arm angle is actually really the angle of the wrist, how it comes out with the baseball. Okay, so if we're, it's a normal arm angle saying on top of the ball, right, that's your wrist getting on top of it. If you're getting on the side of the ball, that means we come across and our wrist is coming out like that. And then we're getting tilt and we're getting on the side or twisting our wrist this way. 
So when it comes to movement of a baseball, I uh, arm angle affects your wrist. Okay. So generally, um, how we're going, I'm just going to go through all of these so you can see it. The lower the arm angle, it's also going to twist that wrist over and you're now going to have a different angle of the ball coming out uh, of your hand than it was normally if it was on top. So that's something to think about. Um, as you see a lot of guys, um, where is their arm on release? Is it on the side? Is it up? Is it over? Is it, what is going on with it? And think about how the ball would move relative to that. And really quickly, that's if it's straight, it's going to just move normally. If it's tilted, it's going to get more horizontal movement. So like Jimmy Yacobonis, I mean, he throws a two-seamer, but it's like moves so much because he's pretty much throwing it sidearm, and that essentially amplifies the movement going arm side. Okay, so that, that's it about arm angle and wrist angle as well. Let's go to four seamers. I made these pictures <laughs> and I have like giant fingers. So you can't really see much of the ball in these. And I'm really sorry, but hopefully you guys can get a good sense uh, of that. That's essentially straight across the horseshoe. If you are righty, that is the end of the horseshoe. Like the bottom of it is on the right side. If you're lefty, it's on the left side. Okay, index fingers on the left there, middle is on the right. Uh, so, and a good example of a course of a four seam fastball would be Garrett Cole's I mean, you can see just how it just aggressively went straight up in the zone one more time. Beautiful, right? It, that's that's just such an amazing pitch. I had a touch of ride as he's not completely over the top of it. But that's a, that's a, that's a typical four-seamer. Okay. So uh, next, let's go on to sinkers and two-seamers. Now, they're known as SI or FT. And so I'm sure there's a lot of questions like, okay, what is a two-seamer? What is a sinker? Are they synonymous? And I used to think, I mean, I used, not think, I used to essentially separate them entirely but honestly, uh, it's it's much more condensed than you think because most of the time, both pitches have both horizontal ride and depth. So sinkers are ones are fastballs that have amplified uh, depth to them, and two seamers are ones that have horizontal ride. That is arm side lateral movement. And yeah, they most of the time they have both. It's like a diagonal going down. So you can pretty much say either one these days. I like sinker because it's just quicker. Two seam fastball, too long. Four seam fastball, too close together. Sinker, four seamer, easy, done. So I'm going to refer to them as sinkers moving forward. You can also see them refer to it as an FT. I just think that's the same thing. Don't be too confused. Like, oh, is it two seamer sinker? There's pretty much like only one pitcher who maybe differentiates, and that's Mike Soroka. Bless him. Um, anyway, so general velocity of of your sinker, it's the same thing really as a four seamer, but generally slightly slower. So half a tick down, maybe a full tick sometimes for them, but it's kind of hard to, to differentiate. Sometimes you do see like a three uh, mile per hour drop. Like Jack Flaherty's actually, is like more 91 and his four seam is more 94. So if you see all of a sudden that aggressive horizontal and vertical movement, um, kind of like a hump to a fastball all of a sudden, but it's like still in the nineties, you might think, okay, actually I think that's a sinker showing up. So yeah, so normally in the low mid nineties around 92 and movement while well, we kind of went over that, it's a diagonal arm side, horizontal and vertical drop. So you go from the center and then going down with the diagonal to the corner. Um, how that's generally thrown, there are a million grips of this. Um, this is a generic one, and I tried to, I did it aside so you can actually see where I am relative to the horseshoe. Uh, it's straight over, as uh, Lewis Thorpe would call the railroad tracks, right? Straight ahead, straight down the middle, and generally there is a tilt to it so that you emphasize that horizontal, um, essentially gain the ball going laminar flow along the, the smooth part of the ball, right? Because there's only two seams there in the way, so it's really smooth there. Um, so a good example of it is Sandy Alcantara's. I love this power sinker that he has. Uh, you can see the drop and the horizontal bend. That started on the plate and ended off. You can see as Anthony Recker is very upset at himself. That's at 97 miles per hour. It's such a good pitch when he throws it off the plate like that. And you get a whiff with it. Uh, and we'll talk about whiffs later. Anyway, so there it is again. That's a beautiful pitch. Um, moving forward, cutters. So those are labeled as FC or CT. Uh, these pitches are weird. Okay, cutters are like, uh, you watch them and you think, is that a cutter? Is it a slider? Is it just a four-seamer? There are certain times when it is apparent and sometimes that it's not. And it can be very difficult to pick it out on the fly. Um, but hopefully we have some things that can help. So generally velocity, if they are throwing a cutter, uh, it is about three to five mile per hour slower, maybe three to seven at times. If it's one of the slower ones that might be mislabeled because it's really a slider. Uh, but it generally, if you take off some movement, or sorry, some velocity to gain some extra movement 
to it. And that kind of movement is horizontal glove side with a tip with like a tinge of it. And then I, uh, then you have vertical drop as well. So just think the diagonal as we'll get to have a slider in a moment, but just less amplified. So, I mean, just imagine Moe's cutter. I mean, it had movement that you could tell, but it wasn't like a breaking ball type of movement. Uh, so yeah, think of slider with less movement in both directions. And generally it's thrown like this, which is, um, a mix between your four seamer and your uh, and your slider. Some people can just throw a four seamer and they have natural wrist tilt that will dictate a uh, a, a cutter, a cut action to it, but that just turns into a cutter. But for the most part, what you're doing is you're blending um, a four seamer and a slider where you, uh, you have the four seamer grip, but then you're focusing on falling off with your middle finger. So if you want, you can tilt it like I show here, you can also throw the four seamer grip, but then focus on pushing down with your with your middle finger to get that extra movement and make it so that's not full spin going back, um, getting that back spin like you normally do with a four seamer, but actually getting more of that side spin that will allow it to get that movement. Okay, um, here's a good example. Modern one, of course, is Kenley Jansen. And it's not super aggressive, right? This is subtle movement. Uh, this one's coming at 90. It was a bad day for him. <laughs> and when it peaked, Jansen's like 94 with this. Um, but you can kind of see it comes back to the plate. Uh, and is this Wrecker again? I hope it is. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I'm oh, sorry. But yeah, you can see that it gets lateral and a little bit of a dip at the end as well. Um, that's just, just a very good cutter um, as he seals a strike. First pitch strike. Ooh, beautiful. Um, so sliders, right. So Velocity is generally low to mid 80s um, to low 90s. If that's the case, it's like crazy. Let's think of like your elite relievers um, or your like Jacob deGrom or, or uh, no Syndergaard. But it's normally 7 to 12 mile per hour slower than four seamer. So it's it, it's slower than your cutter and amplified movement, right? Now, the movement's weird because it can be really lateral at times. But it can also be very depth as well, right? It's like it's it's based on what's happening with the arm angle. Are they staying fully on top of the grip, or are they going to the side? The more you go to the side, the more horizontal bend you get. But if you stay on top, it will just fall straight down. So we're gonna actually see. Um, so yeah, most of the time it's like a blend of it, of course, like Bieber and Kluber. Um, the grip of it is like that. And essentially, I mean, right now I'm I'm on the side a little too much just to showcase the seams. But really, you want to stay as straight on it as you can um that that makes allows you to get on top of it better if you go like this and you're gonna find yourself twisting your wrist too much and it's just gonna kind of fizzle out so i wanted to actually show two different types of sliders um we have Chaz rose right here that's such a gorgeous pitch um you saw the massive horizontal bend on that and actually dan Strelo was talking about his a little bit too doing that a little bit but then getting on top of it too it's weird um, and then you have the the vertical version, um, uh, Kelvin Herrera, which is just going to drop straight down. Ah, it got choppy here. Let me do that again. Uh, there you go. It's pure depth to that. It's not really. It does have some horizontal bend, but that's going down. That's where the real uh, the real movement lies in it. So you're going to see both of them. Really think of the uh, velocity helping you figure out like if it's a curveball or a slider, because generally, if it's in the low 80s, that's not going to be a curveball. Well, uh, so we'll get to the curveball in a moment, but changeup is next, uh, and this one's got a lot to it. So I have it listed as changeup and FS, that's fastball split, and I'll explain why in a moment. But generally, velocity is low to mid 80s on changeups. Again, 7 to 15 miles per hour slower. Generally, it's slightly slower than a slider. Like you'll have someone throw like an 87 mile per hour slider and then in like an 86 and a half changeup. Always just slightly different. Um, Zach Greinke and Felix Hernandez are exceptions and it's hilarious. And I'm amazed that they're able to throw changeups that are the same speed as their four seamer. I don't really understand it fully. I, I, I can, I'm going to talk about that in a second about how they are maybe doing that, but it's, uh, it's, it's very odd. Uh, not typical. So movement, um, can have a uh, horizontal movement arm side. It can also have vertical drop pretty much always vertical drop. But the, there's sometimes when it just looks straight like a fastball, but it's 10 miles per hour slower and doesn't really have accentuated drop. Um, a lot of times you see that horizontal bend as well. And there's reasons for that. It, it, it based on the grip that they have, because changeups, there are a lot of different grips for it. It's not as standard as say your slider or your four seamer. So, so let's talk about this. I, you have the four seamer circle change grip, uh, which is generally going to be 
uh, just like a four seamer, but in the opposite direction. That is, instead of staying up, it's going to go down, but not really have that horizontal uh, two seam short circle change grip. So think of like a two seamer, but then just slower. So it's going to be amplified. It's really think of like a sinker uh, that is going to go the diagonal, but more of it and slower as well. And then you have the split change grip, which is actually kind of what Zach Greinke and Felix Hernandez are doing. I know Felix says I'm not fully certain if Greinke is. But essentially, it, that's like your you stuff the ball into your hand a little bit, uh, like, like a splitter. And that allows you to keep a lot of the velocity while getting drop on it by utilizing the bulge of the ball. But this is something I talk about a lot. I don't like splitters. I don't like split changes because it's a volatile thing. You're shoving the ball into your, into your fingers. And that's a harder thing to be consistent with than just going to the same spot on the ball every single time for the seams. And why are splitters here? Because I don't really want to group them with anything else. They move pretty much the same as a changeup, um, like a split changeup. They often get confused for each other as well. I generally splitters, if it's a true splitter, is going to be a little bit harder than your standard changeup. Um, like for example, Tanaka's is like 87 when he's killing it, um, and his four seamer is like 91 or so. I uh, and his slider is down to like the mid uh, mid to low 80s. So it's because they are getting less of the ball to hold up and they're really just kind of letting it go. Um, but it's, I like splitters, but they're really inconsistent. They also cause a lot of blisters and stuff too for people. So we don't really see them anymore. And honestly, when you're watching this stuff, if you think it has that kind of dramatic drop, just call it a, a split change and maybe it is a splitter later. Um, so here are change of grips. I mean, I, I like, I just completely <laughs> covered the entire ball. So <laughs> I'm trying to do this, but yeah, you can see on the left, um, the four seam grip is uh, your um, ring and your middle finger making the change of grip with a circle with your uh, index and your thumb. You can see a little more clearly with that with the two seam grip on the right. But you see these are essentially four seam and two seam grips, but then just with your middle ring finger instead. And this is actually something I talk about with inconsistencies of change ups is some guys can't throw these because they're throwing with their ring finger all of a sudden. No other pitch does that while they're not using their index finger, which is involved in every other pitch. So that might be something that people just aren't comfortable with and why they can't develop a good changeup. So I want to showcase um, your typical changeup from one of these. This is a two-seam grip from, uh, from Luis Castillo. I mean, how could I not use him? And you see the complete vertical and horizontal drop here going down and away from essentially the middle down on the zone to just completely not in the zone whatsoever. Beautifully executed here. Um, and then you have the split change splitter grip. This is a generic one. This might be, this might even just be too much uh, of like too much split. It might even be pulled back a little bit more sometimes. Uh, now people are asking about the Vulcan change. That is, uh, that is essentially the same thing, but using your middle and ring finger instead of your index in middle. I don't quite understand why you'd want to introduce that. It's just more awkward in my opinion, but some people are more comfortable with it. And that's that you're going to see more exaggerated vertical drop here. So here is uh, Kirby Yates, and you can see it goes straight down. I mean, this is a very vicious straight down pitch. You can tell that that has some sort of split variety because of that. Sometimes you do see changeups like that, but a little bit more on the horizontal side. Like, a, uh, for example, Steven Strasburg does this really well when he executes this perfectly, but this is your standard split change. I mean, that's incredible. Um, all right, so curveballs, the fun one. Uh, curveballs are completely different than like everything else, which is great uh, because it's cool and stuff to be different. Uh, <laughs> curveball is known as those three. I prefer to do CB because C can be confusing if it's change up or if it's cutter. So I do CB just and I don't use anything for CU. Now KC is there too, which is for knuckle curve. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, briefly. So Generally, velocity is your biggest key for curveballs. If it's in the mid-70s and the guy's throwing in the 90s, it's a curveball. Like, there's your biggest hit. What was that pitch? Oh, it's at 78. It's a curveball. Done. Easy. Uh, sometimes you see, like, Jordano Ventura when he was, you know, uh, rest his soul. He was throwing, like, 89 and 88, uh, 87 mile per hour curveballs, which is ridiculous. Uh, I still don't really understand how he did. I don't even think he did a knuckle curve grip. Crazy. But you have, like, uh, Lance McCullers and stuff that does the mid-80s now as well, uh, Dylan Batanza's too. But generally 15 to 20 mile per hour slower than your four seamer. Remember, four seamers are your sinker, 
Um, those are your baseline for understanding velocity with everything else, right? If you, you just need to see fastball, okay, he's throwing like, oh, he throws 86. All right, well, then I got to think like sliders are going to be actually upper 70s, maybe something like that. So you have to have that baseline, but then generally like, oh, he's throwing 98. Well, he might be touching 90, 91 on those initial secondary stuff. And then curveball could be like 82, something like that. Um, so it really helps. It's a big hint while watching games. Um, so the movement of curveballs, you guys probably know, of course, big hump to it vertical drop there are slurves um that are glove side movement and all that is is back to arm angle is you are throwing a curveball but you're tilting the entire thing and then if you realize if you're on the side like this this is actually a slider right if you are all the way down with your wrist this way it's just like staying on top of a slider so you're going to have a hint of horizontal bend from that and that's generally where you get those big slurvy curveballs like jose Brios. but then again he doesn't even call it a curveball i guess i don't know that's a weird thing that I got to get to the bottom of. But uh, but you have those slurvy pitches because of Rich Hill is a great example. He has such a low arm angle, really comes around um, that curveball grip to make it kind of like a slider. And hence, you have that slurve. It's just a curveball. It's just a curveball, guys. So knuckle curves, they are generally harder thrown. Um, they come a little bit harder. They're really, I'm amazed that the guys can do this. Essentially, they have the curveball grip and there are two of them. One is in between the seams with the index and middle finger. And one of them is just with your middle finger and then popping the gun is what they would teach uh, younger kids. Uh, that one, you then take that and then you have your finger on the ball as well, pushing out to get extra spin on it. It's crazy, um, but it has harsher movement, a little bit harder velocity, but it's just a little more volatile. Uh, so there's your standard Barry Zito curveball grip. That's the way I used to throw it. Um, if you see, so you have your index finger on that top seam, but you can have the uh, the middle finger there in two and just have the pop the gun as I just described. Here is, I think, the most standard looking right-handed curve I can think of, which is Joe Biagini's, which just falls from the sky. It's just so beautiful. I love this thing. Look at that. Like he's just totally straight over the top and just going north-south. Ah, oh, I love it. I could watch this for days. Like it, it's, it's such a beautiful pitch. I still don't quite understand how Joe Biagini wasn't a bigger thing, but... So it goes, I guess. Um, anyway, I uh, so there are other pitches that I haven't mentioned here. Uh, and I have a lot more of this presentation left. Uh, don't you worry. Uh, so there's the knuckleball. We don't trust those whatsoever. We have I mean, knuckleballs. You guys don't need my help to identify those. Obviously, you're erratic and you throw it essentially by taking your fingers and then exploding on release, which is crazy to me. In EFIS, now... An EFIS is a slow fastball. And what I mean by that is they're literally just lobbing it in. A lot of people confuse this with a slow curve. And a slow curve is actually a curveball grip, just a slower arm angle. Uh, it's arm, arm action, I should say. Uh, so they just slow down their arm as they throw a curveball, and that's a slow curve. An EFIS is not that. It's a four-seamer grip, just gripping the baseball normally and lobbing it in. Big difference there. Fork balls are like the split grip, but it's much more wider. It's wider, really going after the, the bulges of the ball. And then staying on top and getting a big hump to it. You really don't see anyone throw this anymore. Jose Contreras had a really good one back in the day. Uh, but that's really like the only one I can think of. Uh, screwballs. Biggest misconception out there is what a screwball is. It's really simple, actually. You take a curveball. And as you throw it, we're talking about arm angles, instead of going this way or that, what you're doing is you're trying to mimic a curveball from the opposite arm. So if you think of that, this is a curveball coming out. The opposite arm would be doing this. So you have to mimic as a righty what a lefty would be like, which essentially means you have to turn your head or hand all the way around and then throw it so it comes out of your hand that way, like over the top of it. This is what a screwball is, and it's with a, cr a uh, curveball grip. Yes, this looks so painful because it is painful. Destroys arms. Don't throw this. Anyone that wants to tell you that like a changeup was a screwgee or something like that, all that is is they're just falling off the ball, which is, yes, it is um, pronating, but the extremity of pronation needed for a screwball is not just open to the side. It's going forward as well and turning, and as a curveball and not like just your uh, change of coming off the side of the ball. That's not a screwball. It's really ridiculous. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough. No one should throw them. There's no reason to, it's not like all of a sudden this amazing pitch is going to make you 
a major leaguer now. If you can do everything else, you know, uh, yeah, it just don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> and yeah, don't expect any of these pitches to show up offense. Why I didn't really focus on them. Okay. It's time for the good stuff, right? This is the fun part of this, where we actually talk about intent and what they're trying to do on every single at bat. Okay. This is where you can really understand what's going on inside of the game and the pure chess mass that's going on. So we are going to talk about the velocity. We already talked about the velocity and the movement, rather. What is now the pitcher's goal? Did they execute that goal? And then what now, based on what just happened, comes next? This is the best part of baseball. Oh my God. It's like, it's the best. It is the best. It is the absolute best thing ever. Um, so let's get talk first about the bad stuff, right? What are the worst locations for pitches? Well, that would be here as a lefty and this as a righty. So I'm always doing this from the pitcher view as a righty facing lefty righty. It, obviously reverse if it's, you know, lefty versus right hand, all that kind of stuff. This is a right-handed pitcher going against a left-handed batter. The red boxes are where you generally don't want to throw pitches. And the reason for this is uh, if you think about a, a batter extending the bat and getting his arms out, like you take a hack, a dry hack, you're hitting essentially these locations. Um, most normally it's actually going to be this one up in a way to a lefty. And then if you just drop your arm and figure out where do I not need to adjust anything to hit the ball, this is actually where the bat swings is through all of this. So all the way at the bottom here, this is a batter dropping the barrel, literally not making any adjustments with their body or stuff. They just drop the bat and that's where the barrel goes through is the down and in corner. So actually you don't really want to do those spots. That's where you want to avoid. Uh, so in general, if you see guys throw there, uh, it's not necessarily an automatic mistake. Um, for example, DeGrom might go up and away with a cur uh, fastball here. So I might throw a first pitch curveball that's in this spot too, and that's fine. They're just, But in general, if you're trying to make the best pitch you can, you, for the most part, are not trying to hit these locations. Okay, so let's go back to four seamers. These are the two locations you're generally going for. So you're trying to go up and in or elevate. Elevate late in counts. Um, you generally don't want to throw your first pitches above the zone. Generally, your early counts and trying to get to two strikes, uh, you're going down and away or up and in. Those are the two spots. If I can see a guy go up and in to both lefties and righties consistently, that's one of the most impressive things you can find from a pitcher. It's just, it's amazing if they can do that with any sort of consistency and success. As the count gets later, then of course the top of the zone opens up. And of course, up and away is okay deeper in the count, but generally in, uh, more inside is better. It's just easier to, to, well, harder for the batter to hit it. If you notice again that I have the inside and middle good, but not down, because of course that's where the barrel of the bat goes through. All right. And this is something really cool. Uh, this is uh, brought to you by Colin Charles, as you just saw on the round table. Colin Charles is a manager of our data science team. And he gave me this uh, these charts that are swing strike rates for specific pitches based on their locations, which is amazing. Uh, this, is, this is so cool. Uh, so I'm uh, really only going to be focusing on the left side because these are the, the, uh, the right-handed pitchers. But you can see whiffs happen up in the zone and they barely happen low. Like I cannot tell you how few pitches I can think of where they whiff down. Like they're just, it, the pitch is never a strike. So out of the hand, they don't think like, oh, this is going to come back up to the zone. They just don't. So they very rarely swing at those. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's all just up. Uh, all right. So sinkers. So sinkers are different. Sinkers, you can't get away with the same stuff because you're not going to fly underneath the bats a lot. There are times that you are. Sometimes sinkers also act like four seamers, like uh, Andrew Heaney's uh, sinker acts like a four seamer. So you want to go up with that one. And there are often times that no one, that they don't really throw four seamers. So they try to go up with two seamers and it can work. It's just a worse pitch in general than four seamers to go up. So let's focus on the one on the right here, the, the right hand batters. You want to throw this off the plate inside. You have so much horizontal movement that you want to start on the plate and go inside. Up and in is fine. And I, I could have highlighted it here, but it's really hard to execute that one well. I mean, it's, it's very rare. I, I mean, I'm okay with it. It's just not really what you're trying to do. You're not going to find many batters that swing at that pitch. So you're really not aiming for it, but I'm okay with it. And like, I sh probably should have made that one blue, but it's fine. Now notice there's a danger area here. I, 
down and in and off the plate is really good. You're going to get a lot of guys swinging over that because it does start as a strike and then falls off. But this pitch is actually starts as middle of the plate and then turns into uh, the sweet spot, right? So you don't want to throw down and in. That's not where you want to see these pitches. Up in a uh, middle and inside is actually really good because you can get a lot of guys that are getting jammed there. If I had this into more um, more uh, divided cells, yeah, half of this is really bad and half of this is fine. Because like the more middle you go, it gets more and more dangerous. I really just want to emphasize that you want to go middle and inside because the guys will not be able to lay off of that. And of course, you have like the beautiful Aaron Nola back door, uh, two seamers to right-handers coming in the outside corner. Um, and the same idea, just reverse with left-handers so you can freeze them inside by doing front door two seamers up and in middle, but you can't do that down because then they'll just, they'll stay in on it and then they'll swipe it. You can get sneaky with it and maybe it's like a high risk, high reward, but generally you want that higher up than down. And then of course you want to stay away from them as well. And yes, you can actually get some whiffs from time to time or actually less whiffs, but also just end of the bat swings uh, off the plate um, away to a left-hander as well. Uh, so you can see actually with the whiffs here, you can see the most whiffs you get against righties is down and in, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but you're not always trying to get a whiff with a sinker. You're trying to get bad contact with a sinker. So it's why, for example, uh, you're not seeing anything up and in for righties. It's because if they're swinging at that, they're just going to hit it. Uh, but you can also see that you don't see any whiffs down and away because they're not swinging. The pitch is not a pitch forever. And if they if that's going to be an effective strike, it's because they didn't swing. Really crazy to see, by the way, lefties are just really good at this, apparently. I'm thinking of like Jose um, Alvarado and that ridiculous two-seamer that he just eats guys up inside with. Um, I, that's, it's, it's, that's really fascinating how much I uh, emphasize that is. Okay, so cutters. Oh, I didn't fix the animations. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, cutters, uh, in general, are going to act like sliders where you want to start outside and then fall off the plate to a right-hander. You can do a front door one. It's okay. Like you saw with Kenley Jansen before, front door sinkers can be really effective. It's surprising. I think it's a mistake every single time you see up here. Like they definitely weren't trying to get it out of because that's a scary pitch. I mean, you're going to hit his head or you're going to hit that. That's one you normally don't see. This is much more common uh, and much more just you're setting yourself up for more success. Um, against lefties, though, if you're ready, you want to be hammering this thing inside, like jamming them and jamming. Them. That's actually for the most, uh, that's the, the highest usage of a cutter is opposite handedness to just jam pitches inside. Cause like, let's say I have a good sinker. I'm like, oh man, I want to do that to the other side, right? If I'm a righty, I want to do that to a lefty, but I can't, it's a two seamer goes this way. Well, cutter goes the other way and you can do this endlessly. It's really effective. Now there are some cutters that are just like Wade Davis's, which is like a slider, but harder somehow. And that's when you get this zone going and down underneath the zone. I could theoretically add this one to it. It's just kind of a danger area. Uh, for a normal cutter. So I was like, okay, if it's off the plate, then it's all right, fine here. And of course your backdoor stuff as well. Um, so when you see whiffs, like it is down here, right? But I mean, I think this is a lot of cheating. <laughs> Again, I think a lot of times when you get whiffs on cutters, it's, it's. I think of cutters more like the opposite two seamer, which means it shouldn't get whiffs. And if it does get whiffs, then that means that it's uh, uh, more like a slider than, than we really think of a cutter. Um, now there are these weird ones at the top. And that's like the Lance McCullers, sorry, not Lance McCullers, Colin McHugh and Anibal Sanchez, where they actually start the ball at the top of the zone and then comes down in. And then they realize too late, like, oh no, this is going to be a strike and they swing at that. Uh, so that can be effective and don't all of a sudden write off a high cutter as a miss, but just use your judgment to say like, okay, is this kind of their game plan or not? I, I Most likely it's not, but there are some exceptions for that, certainly, and where they can get away with it. And also sometimes cutters are actually just like their fastball. So it just throw it up and it doesn't actually have so much cut action. So it can have that rise and be an effective heater up. But yeah, you can see it, you can really eat guys up inside with cutters. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Actually, this is weird. What am I seeing here? This is the lefty. This, oh, going away. I'm sorry, falling away from right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you eat them up over here? Yeah, yeah. Eat up lefties over here. That's what I'm going for. Okay. Uh, sliders, right. Sliders, you just want down. Like down, down, down. <laughs> Against a lefty. Like you do, it's going into the bat of a lefty. So you got to be very careful about that. Uh, so you don't want this to fall into the zone unless you're trying to do a back door, which can be really effective. Um, Tanaka does this a lot to lefties. Uh, this can be easy strikes to steal and they have to stay back and push to left field. 
that can happen if you're like Juan Soto or something like that, but not not a common thing. Uh, what uh, what you'll see against righties though is you just want to stay away. Max Scherzer, sure, he'll go inside and do that backup slider. Very risky because if a guy is willing to eat a heater, like take one off, then he'll stay in long enough to be able to pull that down the line. Uh, so you want to be staying away with sliders. And actually, honestly, sliders that are in the zone and taken early in counts, don't treat that as a negative. A lot of times they just need to get a slider for a strike, and that's totally fine. And if it has good movement, it has good movement. It's not necessarily a hanging pitch because it's over here, you know, in the middle of the zone. It could just be a really good spun one that just isn't put in the right spot. So it's still hard to hit if it's going. But a lot of times they're trying to go down here, and then it comes out of the hand wrong. And then it's a cement mixer that doesn't do anything. Then it gets smacked. So no surprises here. I uh, down and in the lefties, duh. Excuse me. And then of course, then we have I uh, down and away to righties. I mean, this is just a death sentence. Now, not too many in the zone, of course. So keep that in mind. Um, change ups. This is the really. I think this is the best one here. This is where you want to throw change ups. And this might surprise some of you. Because you might think with right-handers that you actually want to be throwing away much more. And you don't. Because this, if the pitch is located here, it's never a strike, right? It's going back in towards a right-hander, so it stays away and then never comes back over the zone. Uh, you want if This is very harmful down in, in the zone, in the middle. Because uh, that starts as a strike away and then comes back and comes closer to the barrel of the bat. So this is a very easy adjustment to make this diagonal. And same thing over here. But this is such a um, tease to batters. If they think this is going to be a strike and then it comes off down and in, oh my, those are ready, ready crimes. And those are absolutely beautiful. And with lefties, it's the same idea, but you can't sneak the front door here. So it's, you're just staying away. You, can, you can't sneak the front door that looks like it and then go underneath. But these are all going to be balls. You can maybe do this. I've seen that at time from time to time. Kind of like a two-seamer and stuff. And that's okay. It's very rare to see guys intentionally do that, it's a hard thing to do. So I'm not I uh, I'm not a huge fan of it. I would think much better to do it as a two seamer because they have more time to react, right? If they think they're going to get hit by a pitch, but they think, oh, I'm not. You want that to be faster, ten miles per hour faster. If it's a slower one, oh, I'm going to get hit. Oh, wait, I'm not. They actually have time to adjust and actually turn on that inside changeup. All uh, right. So this is probably shocking to people. Look at this. Look at the swing strike rate. This is 40%. Like, this is crazy. And when changeups are executed righty righty under the zone, like that is the that is the heaviest red we've seen. And it is so like guys can't resist that. They, you know, they only want one thing, and that's a change of hung down the middle, right? Uh, or a fastball right down the middle. So that is a real takeaway for me. Um, it shocked me how effective chains are a, a righty on righty and same thing lefty on lefty. I mean, this is still unbelievably effective. So that's something we, I hope we get to see more um, guys really embracing the um, righty on righty or lefty on lefty changeup and curveballs. Okay. Uh, so curveballs um, are uh, again, bottom of the zone. No surprise here. I will say I could have put um, middle a lot here because a lot of times curveballs are just going to be spit on. Uh, if it starts high, if it's like an OO pitch that they think it's going to be a high fastball comes out into the zone, but it's generally not the intent. The intent is to be at the bottom of the zone. You don't want it to be indoor, front door. That's a really easy, if it's like a big curveball, they can just hook that thing down the line easily. Um, and definitely you don't want to go into a lefty because that's just going straight into the barrel. Uh, so you want to stay away. This is okay down in the middle because it doesn't look like a strike for a while. It's not the best, but it's okay. Same thing over here. But you generally want to stay away and under the zone. If you, if you can confidently hit right here before it hits the dirt, I mean, it's it's a fantastic pitch. And then, of course, eating up lefties away as well. Um, and then, this, no surprise here, this is where your whiffs are, uh, exactly where you think. Um, away to righties and inside, down and into lefties. I mean, it's, yeah, pretty easy here. So, all right. All of that being said, we've got some more fun things. We're not done. We're not done with this presentation, this conversation about pitches, right? A pitch conversation. Okay. Going back to this Oliver Drake pitch, we've learned a lot about different pitch types now. And what do you think? Now, watching this again, what do you think this is? And I want you to come to your own conclusion. Okay. So it's at 84 miles per hour. It's moving right to left and arm angle. 
And arm angle, I think, is the biggest thing for us to do here. So this is probably the stupidest thing I'll ever do at ending presentation. Uh, but it's mine, so I'm going to do it now. Okay. Uh, so here it is again. Now, here is his release point. Now, this is crazy. This is a really crazy thing. And when it comes to arm angle, I think a thing that you need to really internalize is that to create an arm angle, you actually need to move your entire shoulders and your and your torso and your head to uh, create that arm angle, right? If I want to pitch over here, I'm not going to just stand up and put up there. I'm going to actually turn my body. So what he's doing, and this is hilarious, I took him and reversed him 90 degrees. You can see this just like a normal side armor, right? It's, he's, his whole body is the same. He's just turned it all the way, right? So he's actually coming across like a side armor, but just doing it from this angle. That's literally what's going on. Nothing crazy. So when the ball is released, he's actually throwing a split change. And just that split change has that aggressive movement. And he's getting on top of it. So looking at it one more time, he's just tilting so far, getting straight on top, and just going down and away. Uh, I think that's just a really good expression of all the things that we've just put together in one. Okay. But now, now everybody, let's do it live. Right? Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it live. Let's just, let's just do it in a bat together. Let's just do it. Let's like take everything we did and I want to showcase what can happen when you understand all these things. And uh, some of you might remember that I put out a video about this at bat last year. Um, I think it's such a fantastic expression of not only understanding a pitcher on the fly, but also understanding like learning their pitches and then understanding in a bat and a story that leads to the absolute joy of watching uh, a pitcher perform well in baseball. Okay, why I love baseball so much. So we have Zach Gallon against Paul Goldschmidt. It's the bottom of the fourth. It's a one nothing game. Bases are empty. Nobody out. First batter of the inning. Okay. So Goldschmidt, fearful hitter, like big guy, struck out in the first inning looking at a fastball. All right. Gallon knows this. Goldschmidt knows this. First pitch is coming in. He goes, look, I'm going to throw him this, okay? Do your quick math here. I, I'm going to purposely not tell you what every pitch is as we do it, but for those trying to figure it out, learning, that's a curveball, right? Upper 90, upper 70s, big drop to it, vertical. Gallon does a good job of staying on top. That stuff is, vert that stuff is going north-south, okay? All right, Goldschmidt swings through it. So it comes to, we come to the second pitch of this, all right? So there's, yeah, there's the first one, okay? Uh, how do I skip through? There we go. Beautiful. Oh, one pitch, right? So does he go back with a fastball now? Does he go with something else? Uh, Gallon says, you know what? I've got him. Oh, one. I'm going to do something else. Okay. So what pitch is that? Gallon calls it a cutter because of how he thinks when he throws it. It's a slider. Um, it's actually a slider grip, but he has to think mentally that it's a cutter um, in order for him to stay on top and not wrap his arm around it or wrap his wrist around the ball and release. So right, 84 miles per hour, had dropped to it, but also had horizontal bend, right? I mean, you can see this again, moving across the zone, but mostly having drop at a faster speed than the curveball. Easy to differentiate. That was a curveball 77, 84, that's a slider. Goldschmidt takes it, all right? It starts on the zone, like this is a strike for a lot of the time, and then it just isn't, okay? He takes it, he goes, all right, look, just threw me a curveball, threw me, threw me a slider. He's probably thinking fastball again, right? So Gallon, Gallon doesn't give in. He throws another slider. And this one isn't perfect. You know, it's a little too much, maybe middle, maybe one of that a little more outside, but that's good. It's down. Goldschmidt fouls it off, right? He went at him again. That's three breaking balls in a row now. He's at one and one and two. And uh, there's this pitch one more time. Slider, right? Same thing. So one and two, sequencing wise, I think you can probably guess what the next pitch is, right? He's throwing a curveball and two sliders. Goldschmidt has fouled off two breaking balls. Uh, so Gallon goes with this. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> Goldschmidt sends it for a ride. He crushes this pitch, right? And what's crazy about it is, I mean, look, look really quickly. Look where this glove is. This glove is actually not an ideal situation. I love this idea. High heat now, right? This is what we talk about. You want breaking balls low and, and certain speed and different eye level than your heater 
that you go 0-2 or 1-2, and that's what Gallon does. I don't understand why his glove is here. Maybe it is something that Gallon needs. So like, hey, I know I'm going to go up. I just need the glove here to help with that. Uh, but where, where this pitch ends up here is, is up above the zone. Goldschmidt crushes it. He was waiting for that here. So now you can anticipate Goldschmidt's like, no, not gonna. he's not going to throw me another heater. There, there's no way he's going to do that. I just crushed that one. And he gets another slider. But he missed this one. And that's actually a really good one. That's that's a that's better than the first take. That's a strike for a long time as it goes through the zone. Strike that's a strike right now. That's a strike. Look how late in the in the pitch this is a strike. And then it falls down. Right? And Goldsmith's following me all the way. Say, I knew that I knew that was a slider. Knew that. Okay, two and two is a little different though. Two and two. Do you go with a curveball? Do you go with a slider? Do you go with a fastball? What do you do? I'm I'm excited. I'm ex- I'm excited right now. I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, this is what we get. Another slider. And you can kind of see in the previous one, Goldschmidt ducked down a little bit. He was he was on that slider. He knew he was looking fastball. He didn't really know this one. But Gallon missed it a little bit off the plate. Okay. Now it's 3-2. And that, what do you throw, right? This is Gallon. It's his major league debut. It's the first batter of the inning. You don't want to walk this guy. You don't want to walk him up. Marcelo Zuna is next. Goldschmidt's like, look, I just spat on two sliders. That curveball he missed. Or he threw the first, uh, threw the first strike before. I, I'm sure I can deal with that. Look, he's throwing a fastball now. There's no way. He's not going to get a fastball by me. And this is what Gallon throws. I'm going to do that again because it's stuttered. It's amazing. That's a change up at 85 miles per hour. Goldsmith swings right over it. Absolutely beautiful. So there's so much to take away from this one. One, we haven't seen that, right? If you're just watching this at bat and you're training like Goldsmith, you haven't seen this change up. You didn't even know it's there. You didn't even know that he was capable of doing. But even if you did know that, if you say, okay, I know Gallon has a changeup. The fact that he hasn't thrown this entire at bat in a 3-2 count, the perfect pitch because the entire way that looks like the fastball that Goldschmidt is like, I'm waiting for. I just slugged one 350 feet down the line, right? I'm waiting for this fastball. Gallon gives him a changeup. And executes it so perfectly down in the zone. It looks like a strike forever and earns that strikeout. And that is just beautiful. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. But that's the joy of it. And being able to recognize the pitches that Gallant is throwing on the fly and understanding quickly that that's a change it because that had a touch of horizontal movement and depth at 85 is, is what makes this game so special to me in pitching. So I hope you guys uh, appreciate that moment. I hope you understand what goes into grasping that at bat. And how really, it's not so much of a, of a knowledge hurdle to understand it. So what have we learned during this presentation? Well, we've learned about all different pitch types, their movement, their expected movement, their expected velocity, their grips. Typically, there's a lot of grips out there, but I just gave you guys the basics of them. General usage of those pitches and what to look for during a start. So sequencing, intended locations, and of course, arm angles. And you know, really why baseball is the best thing ever. Oh my God, I miss it so much. (laughs) I really do. I just want it back so badly. Um, But anyway, I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation. I hope you got something out of it. Now's the time for Q&A. Uh, if you have, uh, if you should get Pitch Plus if you don't already, because we watch baseball games together live. Uh, I react to it live. You know, if you want to learn more about this, this is very much the best way to learn more about the game um, with me, of course. Um, not the best way in general, but you know, if you want to interact with me about this stuff, that's how you do it. Um, obviously, reach out to me on Twitter at PitcherList. There's also this 28-minute video of me breaking down Tanaka's terrible start last year as a nightmare start against the Red Sox, uh, and I did it for 28 minutes doing exactly what I just did with Zach Gallen. Um, that will help a bit too, I think, getting in the head of what a pitcher does and when he throws and why he's how at bats come together and why they're so brilliant and like just understanding what they're trying to do and executing and how with a batter is on top of something, what he's looking for, and all that kind of stuff. So definitely endure that. Even as a Yankee fan, I, I mean, I think you, you would enjoy it. But anyway, guys, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, you're all awesome. Uh, thanks so much uh, for supporting PitchCon. And uh, I'm going to open it now 
to questions. Anything you guys have, leave them right now. I'm finally seeing StreamYard. So, um, so okay, cool. So I'm seeing a question now from Who's Your Poppy? So it says in the Discord, um, uh, Patty Ma wants to know if your lefty righty pitch charts are available somewhere. Uh, they aren't right now. Um, that's courtesy of Colin Charles. I'm doing a massive 30,000 word article that's going to talk about all the stuff we just talked about, but also more stuff about mechanics, more things about sequencing, pretty much everything that I'm thinking about during a game. And it's, of course, going to include those charts. But we can, uh, yeah, we can certainly put those out on the Discord. Colin, if you're listening, definitely put it there. Otherwise, I'll do it right after this. Um, but uh, Lydia, uh, what other questions do you guys have? It's cool to see all of you still here. I didn't know if you were. <laughs> um, but yeah, let me uh, keep them coming right now. I'm, I'm going to scroll up just for a moment. Uh, we should have a PitchCon bingo sheet. That sounds hilarious. Um, will presentations be like this available for download? Yes. Uh, good to see you, SB Streamer. Michael will be here, of course, on Sunday for the, the primer of the short season. Um, yes, we're going to put, be putting these up on YouTube. It's actually kind of why we have the quick blip in the middle of the day. So I want to make sure I, I, I download all of these and be able to save them for later. So we're going to have them in a wonderful playlist divided out by, by presentations. Um, entire PitchCon thing, all 40 hours will be there. <clears throat> so I uh, will have that up on YouTube uh, sometime next week. It's going to take a while to do all that stuff, so probably by the end of the week. But uh, that should be uh, super fun. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Brent Honeywell is a screwballer, and uh, it's just not meant to be. It's just not – like, I, 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 I wish he didn't throw it. He doesn't have to. He has other good stuff too. Um, Woodruff is elite. Changed my mind, says Chuck Erickson. Uh, Woodruff's fastball is elite. It was, well, at least it was for 130 innings. His slider, not a major whiff pitch, but he actually does a good job of throwing strikes with it. And I think I didn't give it enough credit earlier on in the season, um, for doing that, but I don't know. We don't know if he's going to be able to gas it up to 96, 97 consistently through starts, um, through the year. Uh, I hope so. He has a split change variety as we saw from this, or as I was talking and you guys know me, it's like, that's not something he can necessarily depend on for strikes, but uh, we'll see how that goes in and out of the season. So I hope so. Uh, Felix Guo in 97 says, how do we expect velocity movement to change when a pitcher goes from starter to reliever? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, velocity goes up generally. Um, it's only about a tick. Sometimes you see like two ticks or so. Because for the most part, a starter can actually throw harder than he does. <clears throat> but he saves it, right? He just doesn't need to go as hard as he can all the time. He's got to throw 100 pitches in that game. So he only has to save like that extra effort for a certain uh, certain situations in the game when they go to a reliever they throw like what 10 pitches 15 pitches or so at most so they uh sometimes 20 or whatever but they can go harder through them and you generally see an uptick of velocity the cool thing about uh danny duffy was that he was throwing hard and then when danny duffy became a starter and had the fantastic season the velocity didn't go down and we're like what why not generally you do see a, a tick or two drop um with it so that movement i would say is actually the same I don't really think that that changes much. If their velocity of their breaking stuff or all their stuff goes up, um, not just the fastball, then we might see extra movement because generally more spin or velocity is tied to spin. So the more spin you get, the more movement you might get. Um, what's the best way to get into the fantasy baseball community? Right, 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 right. Just do your own thing. If it's on Reddit, <clears throat> if it's on, uh, it's on some small site, whatever, you create your own, just write and be a good writer. <laughs> it's not necessarily about the information, how you write, sound interesting. Don't be a, a textbook reciting stats. Don't just say his swing strike rate was this, his O swing is this, his zone rate is this. I think he's good. It's about having a flow and your own voice and, and character and stuff. And yeah, and really, if you do that, I mean, that's that's something that I, I focus on with everybody that we bring on here is that if, if I don't have a sample for me, I need to have one and it needs to be one that is not a textbook, you know, that is actually just you, you know, like someone next to you having a fun conversation that you want to listen to. <clears throat> What's the best pitcher in the upcoming MLB draft this year? Says Marty Tallman. The best pitcher in the upcoming draft. Oh man. Um, that's a great question that you should ask Trevor Huth and Andy Patton uh, during their amazing presentation tonight with Scoobal with Daniel Lynch uh, and uh, Alex Fado. Uh, they are the dynasty guys. Uh, I am terrible when it comes to upcoming drafts. I am not the one to do. Um, if uh, Callan Salinger, uh, Slager, sorry, says, if you can add a pitch from any pitcher to use when you pitched, what would you add? <clears throat> well, I mean, 
I would, I would love to have like Araldus Chapman's four seamer because <laughs> I threw like 80, 81, and then my best day threw 84. Um, I would have really loved to have uh, like just an absolute wipeout slider all the time. So like I would say Bieber slider right now is something that I would put up there. Corbin slider, stuff like that. <laughs> um, let's see here. Do you think there's still room in the game for a pitcher to be effective using more niche pitches like the screwball or knuckleball, or is it past their time with greater emphasis on velocity? Great question. Base to chop. Um, I would say that uh, there is room for knuckleballers. It's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, we've seen R.A. Dickey, like he would, if he, he was still in his prime now, he would totally be killing it, right? I, I don't think that, I, I don't think that pitchers coming up are focusing on it more. Now there's a lot more science devoted to, uh, to how we can improve as pitchers, which I think honestly allows, you know, gives a larger volume of the standard pitch that we know. And then fewer people that will then resort to being a knuckleballer. No one starts off being a knuckleballer. It's always a failed experiment then that uh, turns into something else like the creation of silly putty. So I, I, that's why I think that screwballing, I think all coaches are much more aware of just that is not a healthy thing for your arm. So I don't think that we're going to see a ton of guys that are throwing screwballs a lot. That just doesn't, uh, that doesn't, doesn't seem, seem right to me. Um, <clears throat> uh, nervous name. I will PL plus allow PayPal at some point. Oh, I honestly, if you reach out to me, um, about PayPal for PL plus, uh, we'll certainly, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do something for you. Um, I can look into that. Uh, we work with Stripe to uh, to make that happen, and I don't know if they accept PayPal. I don't think they do. Um, so I uh, so we can we can figure that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just <laughs> I want more people at PL Plus. I just love that community so much, and to, it gives me immense pleasure sharing that with with more people because it's it's a really special place. Um, so hopefully, yeah, reach out to me. Um, you can contact me at info at and we can probably figure something out if that's what's holding you back. 